liberty can realistically be achieved without first restoring homogeneity. Once the question has been read, I will be happy to expand upon my premise, referencing countries that have historically collapsed or faced balkanization as a result of demographic conflict, as well as some of the reasons why I believe that immigration specifically facilitates expansion of the state's control over the population. That's from Jordan. Hey Jordan, how you doing? I'm doing fantastic, Steph. It's great to finally get to talk to you. I've been a really big fan for years. Well, let's hope I don't blow it then. I destroy any <laughs> positive impact you have from the show. So do you want to talk a little bit, uh, for those who aren't aware, and it's not like this is taught in government schools a lot, do you want to talk a little bit about some of the countries that, you've, uh, uh, that you want to reference? Yeah, I'd be glad to. Um, first off, I just want to say that after the Manchester terrorist attack, was when I decided that I finally had to call in and speak up about this. Um, living in the UK, um, we don't get the option to talk about this publicly. Right. So thankfully, you offer the call-in show. It's been a fantastic utility to people like me. So I've written down quite a few examples of countries that have collapsed and been separated into, into separate um, states along ethnic lines or religious lines. Um, you have a Pakistan that separated from India in 1947 due primar primarily to their religious differences where the Muslims and Hindus were unable to live peacefully side by side. And then further, the Bangladesh Liberation War was fought then in 1971 where the cultural and, lu and linguistic differences between the Bengalis and the Pakistanis outweighed any religious unity between those two uh, Muslim regions. Um, there's Czechoslovakia in Europe in 1993. Um, the country obviously split in half. You had the ethnic Czechs and the Slovaks living under one state, which was previously communist. Uh, but the Czechs were much more influential in the communist government, and uh, the Slovaks were very resentful of that. Uh, they separated into what we have today, the Czech Republic and Slovakia. Uh, the Yugoslavia broke up into a whole mess of different countries over the uh, Yugoslav wars fought between 1991 and 2001 into Serb Serbia, Croatia, Bosnia and Herzegovina, Slovenia, Montenegro, Macedonia and Kosovo. And the theme amongst all of these uh, countries is that it was either ethnic groups or religious groups that separated apart and balkanized the country and went and lived in their own areas under their own governments. And the list goes on, but I think you're getting the point now. Right, right. Do you just the more you wanted to add before I sort of weigh in with this uh, challenging question? Yeah, well, um, what made me first sort of realize this. I was reading um, 18th century conservative writer Edmund Burke, and he said, society cannot exist unless a controlling power upon will and appetite be placed somewhere. And the less of it there is within, the more of it there must be without. And uh, these restraints then come from, a po come from within when a population shares cultural and moral values, but when they don't, external force has to be provided to impose those restraints. So what that means then is if you want freedom on a stable political basis, you have to have, or this implies, if it's given to be true, that you have to have a homogenous culture and society composed of people who share the same values and actually want to live together. And they don't want to hurt each other. If you have people with conflicting cultures and values and traditions, then those people can only be held together by the force of a increasingly authoritarian state. Well, as as is the case in many countries in the Middle East and and uh, in 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 Africa and so on, uh, where you have a population that is um, unable or unwilling to restrain themselves according to universal principles, then you're going to end up with increasingly authoritarian regimes. And of course, as multiculturalism has grown. So has the state grown in the West. I don't think these two things are unrelated. I'm not saying they're exactly causal, but they're certainly coincidental. Yeah, of course. Um, what I said in my question as well, I added onto the bottom of it, why I think that um, governments in the West may actually be using immigration specifically to facilitate 
expansion of their own state power. And this is evidenced by the fact that they aren't actually taking measures that will that we know will prevent things like terrorist attacks uh, taking place in the future. Instead, they impose things like um, the Patriot Act or Theresa May in the UK is now proposing uh, sweeping new internet regulations here, massive uh, spying on our own British citizens as a result of a few terrorist attacks taking place. So the reason why I think uh, they aren't you know, preventing immigration into the country, which uh, we know from countries like Poland, you know, which have no terrorist attacks because they don't have a Muslim population, is 100% effective, <laughs> more or less, at preventing terrorism. Um, pe people in government who I think have a innate desire to expand their own power can do so by importing alien elements, which they know will reliably cause social unrest, and then the government can then step in, expand their own power under the grounds of keeping the peace. Right, right. I think that they are profiting, in terms of state power is profiting from a divided culture, but I don't know that it's fundamentally due to that because the policies were put in place um, well, I guess they're just about as old as I am, right? In the mid-1960s, <laughs> in the mid-1960s was when the decision was made throughout the Western world, and it was driven by the leftists, uh, it was driven by the liberals, it was driven by the, Tory, uh, by the um, labor and by uh, the Democrats and so on, to, to bring the third world into the West. To, to switch, I mean, in particular in America, to switch immigration from white Europeans to, well, everyone but... Uh, and so that, it wasn't like the current crop of politicians is, is just attempting to ride that wave. And, and sure, uh, they can um, use terrorist attacks and so on to expand their own power, but fundamentally it was all put in place. I mean, before some of these politicians were even born. So I think laying that at their feet may be a bit. Right. But I will say this, and I, this is an analogy, which I know is not an argument, but... <laughs> but <clears throat> Imagine, imagine you own a sporting goods store and okay. you're in a Sopranos episode and you, you get in deep because you've got a gambling problem. You get in deep with the mob and man, the mob, the, the, the mafia, you got to pay these guys. Like you owe them $150,000 or 200, like you're just not going to be able to pay them with the money that you have. And let's say you're married and you can't hoover up that amount of money out of the family account to pay off. And you can't take a loan out on your business because your wife's got a co-sign, whatever, right? You're stuck. You're stuck. And let's say you're so worried and you're so nervous and you're so anxious that you're not being good at managing your store. It falls into disrepair. You don't order new replacements for your sporting goods and, and people stop coming to your store. So, and, and of course, the mafia is charging more and more interest on you and, and, you know, guys are starting to circle you with baseball bats and, you know, things are looking pretty hopeless in terms of you being able to pay off your bills and, and continue. Well, what out do some people have in that situation? What do they do? There's not much they can do. Sure. Sure, there's something they can do. You know what they can do? They can burn down their store. <laughs> I guess can, that's right. They can burn down their store. They can collect the insurance. They can pay off the mob and they can ride off into the sunset, right? When you can't pay your bills. And it has struck me. There's no chance that the West has to pay off its unfunded liabilities. Like, there's so many multiple times bigger than the entire economy of the West. I mean, we're not just right. talking Illinois, we're not in Chicago, we're not, you know, we're talking California or even Ontario. I mean, my, the, the province I live in, it's a five times per capita debt larger than California, which is called commie fauna or the left coast or <laughs> mad head with a suntan. <laughs> and there's, there's no, like, you, you, can't, you can't pay it off. Now, the traditional answer that governments have when they can't pay off what they owe the population is to start a war. Right. Right, because you start a war, and people are willing to accept sacrifices if there's a war on. 
so in, in times of peacetime, you know, if you go, I don't know, let's say you go to um, people who are either receiving or about to receive old age pensions, and you say, sorry, folks, <laughs> funny story. You voted for all this free stuff, but you didn't really vote to pay for it now, did you? So there's really nothing here, and we can't keep preying on the young because they're already burdened down with student debts that lead them to nowhere but a Starbucks job and a lifetime of writing bitter, angsty, anarchist poetry about the powers that be, <laughs> mistaking the government for the free market at all times. We don't really have enough money for you, so sorry. We're going to have to cut your pension significantly, and you're going to have to double up, and you're going to have to find some way to, to get by. Well, if you try that, of course, everyone's going to go mental because they're not in a fight or flight state where they're willing to accept the concept of sacrifice. Now, in a war, I mean, people will accept rationing, like like little food stamps. They'll accept like getting one stick of butter a week. The women will accept not having stockings, which if you've ever seen British women's legs, <laughs> stockings not always the worst idea in the world, or at least when I was a kid. Hey, let's put some fog over those varicose veins a little, shall we? So people will accept privations. They will accept reduced standard of living. They will accept when, when their fight or flight mechanism gets activated, then they will accept privations. They won't otherwise. And there is this general uh, snowball with regards to immigration in the West. And it's all founded on, on one basic idea that everyone's interchangeable, right? That, that someone, what is the difference if someone comes from Yemen or, or, or Somalia or Papua New Guinea or like, what's the difference? If you think there's any difference, it must be racist, right? I mean, this is... Thousands of years of divergent evolution. <laughs> That's the difference. Of course. Yeah, I mean, there's, you know, different brain volumes, different number of spinal columns, different histories, different cultures, different methodologies for dealing with gender, different concepts of the state, different, I mean, different religions. I mean, you name it, that you... you you don't have to be racist to notice that some fruits are different from other fruits, right? No, it's absolutely right. Right. So, so for the politicians to restrict immigration, they would have to say, I mean, basically they would have to say in England, they would have to say, well, we prefer the people who are here to the people who could be here. And that is going to make the press go mental because the press is going to start screaming racism. I mean, I don't know if you've ever heard this, um, I mean, you probably have, uh, it was in the 60s. Uh, Enoch Powell, British politician, uh, had a speech called Rivers of Blood, which is well worth looking up and, and reading through about how he thought this third world migration was going to end up. And um, it's, let's just say it's worth reading. But of course, even back in the 60s, he was decried as a racist and, and so on. And so now things have become even more hysterical in that regard. Plus, of course, you have a massive voting block of people who want their own countrymen to keep coming in. You know, if you've just come in from Pakistan, you want people from Pakistan, your relatives, your friends, the, your, 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 your childhood friends, all the people you grew up in, you know, come on over, right? It's great here. Oh, lots of free, well, lots of free welfare, free health care, best stuff in the world, right? The fact that they're burdening and important. cracking the system is, is another matter. So you have a huge voting block that you didn't have before, and you have even more hysteria regarding racism than you did in the past. So what politician is going to really want to have anything to do with that, right? Right. That's a very important thing you bring up, how the different ethnic groups that are coming into the West maintain their own ethnic identities, and they don't assimilate to the Western um, Western nations that they're inhabiting. And, and why should um, they? No, seriously, well, they should, why should they? It's not in their they? best interest to do so. Why should they? I mean, they're being paid to not assimilate. That's the whole point of welfare. Exactly. The whole point of welfare is you don't have to learn English. You don't have to adapt to local customs. You don't have to adapt to local work environments. I mean, can you imagine if some horrible, let, let's imagine, let's imagine just for the sake of argument, Jordan, that there's someone in the third world who's sexist, doesn't want to work for a woman, right? So they come to England and then they have a female boss, they mouth off to that female boss, and what happens? Well, they get fired in the West. Yeah, they get fired. And then they go in with their resume saying, well, I worked for 14 days at this place until I called my female manager some unholy word and she fired me. And then the new bosses are going to be like, now we got women working here. That's not going to work out, right? Mm -hmm. So he got yep. no job. What's he going to do then? Well, 
he's going to do what a third of America, a third of the people who moved to America in the 19th century, he's going to move back home because he didn't assimilate. He didn't learn the local customs. I mean, you can't move to some new place and not assimilate unless you're independently wealthy. And as you and I both know, a lot of the people coming into the West from the third world, not exactly the poster childs of independent wealth. So they're being paid to not integrate. Now, integration takes a long time anyway. Like if you look at uh, Chinatown or whatever, uh, when in, in the States, right on the West Coast in particular, you know, the people from China, they lived in Chinatown and um, a lot of them never particularly learned English that well. Their kids, it was a different matter. And then their grandkids were more assimilated. But it takes 75 to 100 years to find out if the assimilation thing is working out. And that was during a time when there was no welfare state. And so in order to succeed, to grow, right, that there was a fruit called success and a punishment called you can't live here because you have no money. And that, even then, it took a long time to integrate. And that, of course, when you're talking about East Asian and Chinese and, and Japanese and so on, well, they got an IQ of 106 on average, they're going to do really well. The welfare state holds very little appeal to people of a high IQ because it's going to trap you in a low rent occupation or a low rent situation. And you can earn much more going out into the free market and getting a job. But if you've got an IQ of 80 or 85, the welfare state is the very best deal for you on the planet. There's no possible incentive for you to want to leave the welfare state, to go out into the free market, to learn a, a cultural morals that you may find abhorrent, to learn a language you find particularly complicated. You, why, why, you, like you, you, you won't do better. Like you won't even come close to doing as well as the kind of income you're getting on the welfare state. So it's like they're building sections of another country. They're putting a big wall around it and they're throwing money and resources into it. And then they're saying, gosh, I wonder why people aren't integrating. Plus, of course, you know, there's interviews with people from the third world saying, you know, we don't want to integrate. Integration, that's your idea. It's not our idea. We don't want to integrate at all. We love our values. We love where we came from. It's not, it's not that yeah, I mean, you, they're openly telling you <laughs> they don't want to integrate a lot, a lot of people. So You've got examples of ethnic groups then who have maintained their own ethnic identity after hundreds of, or, or thousands of years of not having a state of their own. They've permanently inhabited other people's nations and maintained a very strong ethnic identity. For example, you have uh, the Jews, the, the most obvious example five, here. Five, six thousand years, not even a, not even a country managed to maintain their cultural and religious uh, identity in a very strong fashion. Now, the Jews are also facing problems with integration because, like, significant portions of Jewish women are marrying non-Jews, and that is becoming uh, a problem. But, yeah, thousands. It's funny because, of course, you know, there are Jews out there who are preaching multiculturalism and integration and so on. It's like, have you looked in the mirror lately? Not so much <laughs> with the integration. Yeah, they're having a lot of the same problems that the rest of the West is having in general. But a lot of the prob uh, main thing I'm calling up to address is whether I know economically there's no incentive for uh, these foreigners coming into the West to integrate themselves into Western society. But more I wanted to focus on the social and ideological differences because in a lot of the examples that I've looked up historically, and there's hundreds and hundreds of, of historical examples of countries uh, facing balkanization or worse uh, one group being completely removed by whatever means that entails by another group over either religious differences or ethnic differences and people just end up resenting each other over more social and I identitarian um, differences that they have rather than economic ones Religious differences. Let's let's just w w fundamentally, we're talking about religious differences. That's the major source of contention with these kinds of things. And communists <laughs> or leftists. So yeah, I should say. So the question is, how did the West sort out the problem of religious differences? Well, separation of church and state. Because when there was a state religion, then every single religion, as you know, would try and get hold of state power to in impose or enforce its version of religiosity on everyone else. And if, and if they, they couldn't stand aside from that battle, they had to try, because if they didn't, then some other group would get it and their religion would be 
hunted or extinguished or driven out or whatever it was, right? So, so the problem of, this, uh, of religious warfare, which plagued Europe for hundreds and hundreds of years, resulting in millions of deaths, the problem was solved by saying, okay, everybody, back to your corners. The government will not legislate religion. And then everyone was like, ah, okay. <laughs> I'm willing to give that up if everyone else is willing to give that up. I'm willing to have a separation of church and state as long as no one's trying to weasel in through the back door and impose their religion through the state in some nefarious manner. So when it comes to how we live together, the only example I think that really matters, that really works, is a freedom of religion. We need freedom of culture. What that means is a separation of culture and the state. It means a separation of religion and the state. It means a separation of race or ethnicity and the state, which means you need truly colorblind laws. You need laws that um, will not favor one group uh, over another. You need no welfare state. You need um, you know all of the economic freedoms that you can imagine. Then. The productive people will all work together. The unproductive people will probably leave in the long run. And there may be self-segregation into communities. And this is not due to racism. It's due to the fact that people are bloody busy. You know, you got a job. You got a job. You're raising kids. You, you know, you got your bills to pay. You got your house to maintain. I mean, you're busy. You don't have time to learn 12 different languages because there's 12 different languages in your neighborhood. You don't have time to learn 12 different cultures and what people like and don't like and find offensive and don't find offensive. And you don't have time to figure out everyone's religious preferences. It's just easier to deal with people like yourself. And the only people who love diversity tend to be the young who've got lots of time on their hands and love, frankly, banging people from exotic cultures. <laughs> You've got people that have been through uh, government schooling programs. Well, well, yes, but so. it's one thing to go through government schooling programs. It's another thing to try and actually raise your children in a highly diverse environment where you're worried. Everyone's got different religious views. So you're worried about your kid, you know, maybe your kid's your Zoroastrian household and, and across a Buddhist and then down the road is a Muslim or two. And over here are some Christians and there's some atheists. And, you're, you, you know, if your kids all mixed together, how long is your religion going to last? Because they're all going to be talking about their own particular things. And they're going to come back with questions and say, well, Bobby does it this way and Ahmed does it this way and, you know, Naira does it this way. And it's not going to, it's not going to hold I have together. Seen, I haven't read it myself, but I've seen it referenced in some of the research that I've done preparing for this. But, um, are you familiar with the Bowling Alone studies? Oh, yeah, Putnam was his name, name right? Yes, yeah, suggested that... Um, well, the results that he found were that positive social outcomes were... Um, or rather, I'm getting that backwards. Homogeneity in a community was associated with almost exclusively positive social outcomes. Sure. So and, I can and, see and that people diversity, might like to. Yeah, diversity is like a neutron bomb, like the, or I guess it's like the democratic control or the leftist control of a city. The buildings are standing, but nobody goes outside. Uh, everyone cocoons in. So diversity is great for people who make movies and television and video games because nobody goes out. You know what the great competitor is to corporations that want you sitting on a couch? It's the great outdoors. So I think one of the reasons why uh, the media loves pushing diversity is that diversity means that your neighborhood falls apart. You can't go outside, so you sit home and watch TV. But as you mentioned, that um, if, we had, if we had a state where we had... Uh, laws that were entirely founded upon universal principles. We had separation of church and state. We, uh, avo we avoided letting culture influence our, our political policies, etc. Then we may be able to live in a diverse society. But that is a hypothetical. What we'd have right now is the, t the polar opposite of that. We do have governments currently who are passing policies that do benefit certain groups more than they benefit others. Well, so which and is third world why immigrants my question overwhelmingly is, vote for the left, right? Yeah. I mean, you've got, you've got imams in England, as you know, saying that the Muslims who don't vote Labour are going to hell. Of yeah, course. that's exactly yeah. how <laughs> democracy was supposed to function. Good job, everyone. Yeah, we know statistically um, immigrants overwhelmingly vote for the left. But... Um, Realistically, I want to talk about, from our current standpoint, do you think that we can realistically uh, move towards a society that's more founded upon liberty and uh, universal principles from where we are now? 
Oh, no, that's going to happen that- no matter what. I mean, that, that's going to happen no matter what, because the welfare state is going to break. Would it re- require a collapse of our current system? Do you oh, think I mean, that- I don't know. What, what's it like for you, Jordan, talking to people about this stuff? Are they open <laughs> to it or they just close their eyes, put their fingers in their ears, stick it. their asses in the air, stick their ostrich heads in the sand and go, la, 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 I can't hear you. I, I would 100% lose my job if I spoke to this about anyone, uh, to right. anyone in the UK and anyone found out about it. Right. And, you know, so, I've got to so watch yeah, my people, words. Even then. If people won't listen to reason, then they're going to have to listen to bitter experience. There's no, I mean, that's just the way the world works. You know, an addict either finds a way to curb his addiction or he dies or he ends up broke or he ends up in prison. I mean, you either learn from reason and evidence or you're going to have to learn from bitter experience. People don't even want to talk about it. Well, I shouldn't say that. People do want to talk about it. I mean, the majority of people in Europe want an end to Muslim immigration. That's something that needs to be talked about. And right. The problem is the media won't let anyone talk about it. Well, and the police, who seem to be entirely keen on... <laughs> well, it's it's a lot more fun to police people typing mean things on, on Facebook than it is to go into a no-go zone and try and arrest someone, right? I mean, that's I, I understand what the police are doing. I mean, it's, uh, yeah. it's a lot more fun to kick down someone's door if you know they're not going to fight back, right? So... Exactly. The people typing on Facebook aren't going to fight back. If you tried to go into one of the many Muslim no-go zones and arrest someone, then they'll riot. Well, did you see? Um, the- oh, there was a gif recently that was floating around on, I think it was just this last week, about a bunch of migrants chasing a bunch of British policemen who were sprinting, hot-footing it down the street in, in full retreat. I mean, it's... Yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah. so so I mean, what was it? Just just over last weekend, thirteen thousand five hundred migrants from North Africa or from Africa come come to Italy. You can't sustain that. You can't sustain it. So the welfare state. I mean, government's going to run out of money even faster. The, the 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 migrant crisis is going to accelerate the destruction of the socialist redistribution system known as sort of modern democracy. I mean, it's going to uh, take but then it out. What's going to happen faster. after that? Because we are we are. Rest- getting a huge amount of resentment towards the groups in society who we perceive, whether it's accurate or not to reality, but the groups that we perceive to be the cause of these uh, negative social changes that we're experiencing, people have a huge amount of resentment towards those groups. Well, that's, like, uh, that's, Tommy that pisses Robinson, me off. I'm sure you're familiar with him. I'm Tommy sorry. Robinson. Oh, yeah, yeah. The of Rebel course, no, he's been on the show. I'm sorry to interrupt you, Jordan. This pisses me off. This pisses me off. Blaming the migrants is stupid. It's, come on, oh, come on, you have a giant welfare state and no borders. I don't blame the migrants at all. I think they they're are doing exactly what you would do in their situation. I would. I absolutely would. Of course would. you would. Well, you know, they, I might be a burden on the taxpayers and ha, 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 come on. I mean, if, if you leave huge piles of gold out on the front yard and say, we've gone on vacation for a month and you come back and some of your gold is gone. Oh my goodness, those terrible thieves. Ah, okay, maybe what they're doing is wrong, but uh, come on. It's not the fault of the migrants. It's not the fault of the immigrant groups. They're doing exactly what any sane, rational actor would do in their situation. The problem is people have not wanted to talk about the danger and destructiveness of the welfare state, which has now been known for well on 50 years. People have not wanted to take that topic on. The politicians aren't going to take it on. Of course not, because they need a groundswell of opposition to the welfare state before they're even willing to tackle the topic. And so you need people who are going to talk about the welfare state, who are going to talk about the destructiveness of social engineering, who are going to talk about the eugenics of the welfare state, where you're taking money from smart people and giving it to less smart people to have more babies. I mean, we have, it's immoral. It's a violation of property rights. It's a violation of what Europe and the West have stood for for hundreds and hundreds of years. It is a new aristocracy with the bottom at the top. And so the fact is that the West got greedy, uh, women got kind of crazy with their vote and wanted to vote away all the consequences to bad decisions. And so now this is one of the final symptoms. The migrant crisis is a symptom of the self-betrayal of thou shalt not steal, the West has been gorging itself on for the past 50 years. And the wages of sin are problems. You know, if you indulge in a sin, if you indulge in immoral behavior, if you're a drug addict, if you're a food addict, if you're a sex addict or a gambling addict, yes, it is going to harm you. But it's like the gambling addict who blows all of his money and then the bank comes and repossesses his home because he can't pay his mortgage and he says, the problem is the bank. No, 
The bank is the symptom. The migrants are a symptom of your failure in the West to deal with the immorality of the welfare state that has been pointed out since the last couple of hundred years. The last, one of the first things that happened, and, and it's been done before. I did a whole Peter Schiff show on this years ago about Spenumland, which you should look up. S-P-E-E-N-H-A-M-L-A-N-D, Spenumland. It's been done millions of times before. There's the entire example of the goddamn Roman Empire and the welfare state and how it falls down. This has been well known for thousands of years, and Europe just said, well, we'll get it right this time. This, this socialism, this redistribution, this destruction of the family, this, that, this letting the government control the vast movement of trillions of pounds in society, we got it. Never worked before, destroyed entire cultures and civilizations before, but we can taste of this fruit and it'll be just fine. We got this one, we got no problems with it. Magic has happened and we can suddenly have massive numbers of massive amounts of money going through the hands of very few people. They're never going to use it to buy votes. They're never going to be corrupted by that power. People are never going to get dependent on that money. Families won't be destroyed. Neighborhoods won't be destroyed. All of the things that were easily and ably predicted in 1957 by Atlas Shrugged, not to mention the Moynihan Report, not to mention Enoch Powell, not to mention all the people who've been demonized, Joseph McCarthy among them. This redistribution, this socialization of wealth, it was a deal with the devil Everybody had been told that it was going to be a bad idea, and everybody went for it anyway, and has refused to talk about it since. And then they say, well, the problem is the migrants. No. Well, a lot of the resentment of the migrants obviously comes from the individual actions of the migrants once they're in the country. Of course, it's the government's fault for allowing for creating the circumstances under which the migrants can come here in the first place. But you know, when you have something like Rotherham in the UK, where you have what is it like? One thousand five hundred uh, girls molested oh, over more a than molested. several years, for example. More than molested, doused in gasoline, threatened with weapons, passed around, raped into near atomic oblivion. I mean, it's that I mean, creates. it's the most unholy uh, pedophile sex slave ring that that can be conceived of. And uh, I just wanted to sort of point that out. I mean, it's a very mild term that you're yes. using, even I mean, though it's a horrifying very weak term. language. Yeah, I'm used to having to sort of self censor being. A British citizen, but um, that sort of thing going on creates the resentment between uh, the population groups in a country. And I do agree with you that uh, that uh, eventually Western nations will start to collapse. But that resentment's already there, and it's only going to get worse as we go f further towards. But this, this is uh, all... it's like panic situation. No, but and you 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 you're taking away everyone's agency. Look. Racial IQ differences have been known for hundreds of years. I mean, it wasn't called IQ in the past. I mean, the IQ test is about 100 years old, give or take, right? Racial IQ differences have been known for a long time. Incompatibilities between certain ideologies have been known for a long time. So here's the problem. And this is empowering to everyone in the West. Stop blaming other people. Stop blaming your politicians. Stop blaming the media. It's you. You're the problem. When people bring up uncomfortable topics, do you scream that they're racist? Do you scream that they're phobic? Do you scream all of this crap at them and shut them down? What about when the media goes and attacks people? When the media goes and attacks people for speaking the truth, do you continue to buy that media? Do you continue to tune in? Do you continue to consume the ads? Now, I know in England there's the BBC, which is this fascist, Stalinist kind of forced, uh, literally fascist, <laughs> right? I mean, it's a uh, it's, uh, publicly owned uh, propaganda arm. And so I, I, with, in England, there's, there's a challenge with regards to that. And that's not the only place in, in Europe where that happens. But trust me, there's a lot of private or semi-private media outlets that are still eagerly consumed by the British people, even though those media outlets are putting out the most abominable and abhorrent trash imaginable. So do you encourage, are you curious, do you look things up, do you allow for the exercise of the free, free speech rights that you still have to some degree uh, in the West, I mean, particularly, of course, in America? Do you continue to buy and consume media that is harmful to any kind of productive conversation about these challenges? Do you encourage people to, to look these things up? Are you open or do you shut your mouth for fear of disapproval? Do you continue to fund the media that is promoting all these lies and falsehoods? It's you, this looking at other people and, oh, these giant power structures and all that. No, 
Do you send your kids off to uni? Do you send your kids off to university so they can be propagandized into leftist self-destructive androids? Well, if you do, it's not the government. It's not the media. It's not the universities. It's not the politicians. It's you. Who do you vote for? What do you promote? What stand do you take? I'm not saying go get yourself fired. But it's up to every single individual to look in the mirror and say, what can I do? I don't have to be self-destructive, but there's still so many things that you can do that aren't self-destructive. There's still so many things that you can talk about that aren't going to get you in trouble. Of course, you don't want to be the guy who taught his daughter, who taught his dog to do a Hitler salute, but um, <laughs> yep. there's still so much that you can do in private conversation. There's still so much information you can bring to bear uh, with, with people. And if no one's willing to do that, you know, it's, it's an old thing that the late Nathaniel Brandon used to say. He used to say to the people who would complain about their lives, oh, my life's not getting better. I got all these problems, this, that, and the other. He would say, the essence of what I want to tell you is this. No one is coming. No one is coming to save you. No one is coming to make things better. No one is coming to turn things around. It's up to you and only you. Because the moment you think someone else is going to solve the problem and everyone thinks that, the problem will never get solved. You must take action. Inspire other people through your action and do it. I'm not going to do it. Tommy Robinson's not going to do it. Nigel Farage, okay, maybe. <laughs> he's going to get close. <laughs> Nobody can do it. I mean, Donald Trump, he's just one guy. He can't do it. He needs the support of millions and millions of people and everyone has their part to play. Can you look in the mirror and say, you know what, the welfare state was a terrible, terrible idea and is really endangering Western civilization just as it brought down the Roman Empire. And the Roman Empire was swept in and overtaken by people from outside its borders. Oh, it's all so repetitive for words, right? And so this idea, well, but the media and the politicians and this and that and the other, it's like, come on. If, if and not you, but if people feel that passive, then don't even get out of bed. Don't bother fighting because you're going to lose. You have to act in some manner, and there's still more scope and less courage that is required to act now to save your culture and your civilization that's ever been asked of any group before in history. This is not the First World War. You're not being dragged into a trench and having to rub goose fat on your frozen feet so the toes don't snap off like the ends of a popsicle in a car door. You're not being asked to walk into withering German machine gun fire. You're not being bombed by the Luftwaffe with searchlights stabbing up like ghostly fingers to Hitler in the sky. I mean, you, you, you have to have some difficult conversations. You have to look into your heart. You have to be courageous still in At language least, um, only. We knew who the enemy though was, though, right? I'm telling I mean, you who the enemy <laughs> is. The enemy is people in the West's avoidance of the basic reality of what has been told to them over and over and yeah. over again. Welfare state is a bad idea. It's a violation of property rights. Um, and races and ethnicities are different, and we don't know how to bridge that gap as yet. This is all facts. It's all basically empirically proven, right? Yeah. So the enemy is whoever doesn't want to talk about this stuff. And listen, I know England. One thing you fuckers are great at is shaming the living shit out of people. <laughs> There's no... Okay, maybe a constipated highly angry, potentially sumo wrestling Japanese father has a greater and more contemptuous sneer than your average British person, particularly the upper class toughs. Oh, you're so pathetic, you know, like that, that contempt that British people can pour upon those who step out of line. How about using that contempt for good? And how about saying, we're in a desperate strait here, we need to start talking openly and honestly about things. And you see someone holding up one of those pitiful, shitty excuses for newspapers called British tabloids. You say, did you give those people a fucking penny? Get the fuck out of my house. People are tuned into some shitty TV show that's programming and broadcasting all this propaganda. Say, I know you're forced to pay for it. Nobody's forcing you to watch it. Turn that shit off. Or get out of my house. You need to start exercising social ostracism. It's peaceful. It's voluntary. It's perfectly moral. In fact, I would say it's positively moral. And if you're exactly, not willing yeah. to do that, well, then you're like someone who's like standing on the train tracks. And I guess like that old painting of the horse thundering towards the train, you're just standing there. Train's coming. What do you have to do? Lift your fucking foot, step off the tracks. 
and look, you've survived. But if you don't want to lift your foot off the tracks and step off, well, I guess the train is going to wear a new bloodied nose called This Is Where The West Used To Be. So, shall I take from that to bring it back to my original question that you do believe that liberty can still be realistically achieved without first, re well, restoring homogeneity? That, that is more of a, no, listen, what I saw as a possible restoring result. Restoring homogeneity of, is the rivers of blood. You know that, right? Come on. I mean, More or less. homogeneity I mean, there, sounds there real nice. There has been peaceful balkanizations in the past, but they're rare. Most of the time it is a war. <laughs> right. It is, no, that is um, an extraordinarily violent thing that I hope never, ever comes to pass. But is it not, it, it seems, I know you've told me now there's ways that it can be avoided, but it seems sort of inevitable that when the government who is restraining people at the moment finally steps out of the way, the people are going to kill each other. That's what it seems like to me, at least. Well, like this is why you're not hearing what I'm saying. Without the welfare state, proximity. there's nothing. Hang on. Without the welfare state, there's nothing to fight over. The problem. Look, if there's a big group of people from Bangladeshi, of Bangladesh or, or Syria or whoever, if they're like I don't know, living down the road, but they're not taking over the government, that they're not. I don't know, forcing blasphemy laws down my throat, or they're not digging in my wallet for their welfare payments and so on. I got a life to live. They got a life to live. Maybe we'll cross paths. Maybe we'll enjoy each other's food. Maybe we'll chat over the backyard fence from time to time. I don't care. It's fine. I got no problem with it at all. The problem is when they're going to grab the power of the state to control me, then I've like, oh no, now I've got to grow, group up with a bunch of people and try and grab the power of the state before they do. And when the hell does that ever end, right? It's like in prison, you know, you go to prison and, you know, if you're a white guy and you go to prison, maybe there's going to be a bunch of ethnic tensions with other races and groups, ethnicities within the prison. And now, I don't know, like I say, gay for this day, you, you got to go find some group of white people. And it's like, ah, oh, you know, I don't want this gang warfare, but it's, that's because it's prison. So what I'm saying is start to talk to people about the real source of the problem. The real source of the problem is Western immorality. It is Western immorality. It is the welfare state and other things. I'm just, but I'm going to focus on that because that to me is the big central issue. If you can find a way to start convincing people, like, I know you love this thing, man. I know you think it's this beautiful little Himalayan toilet paper playing cat. I know you think this is, this is wonderful. I know you think this is security. I know you think this is safety. I know you think this is a roof over your head and food for your kids and, and dentures for your toddlers. I, I, I know you, there's all these wonderful things that you think the welfare state is in the same way that a cocaine addict thinks that that little white powder is not only the basis for great stick songs, but also your friend. But it's not your friend. It's eating you alive from the inside out. And if people can look at that at the welfare state and say this was a terrible idea this has decayed our civilization destroyed our families undone our neighborhoods and made us a giant magnet for everyone with a cell phone and some legs to walk to come in from all over the world this was a bad idea and we must undo it now if you can undo the welfare state and the coercive redistribution of wealth then the people who want to stay and can contribute to society will stay and contribute to society. I don't care what color they are. I don't care where they've come from. If they can't, again, I don't care where they come from. <laughs> if they can't, then they'll leave. It's the way things work. You know, if, if you're in the Rockettes and you can do a high kick and do all of that complicated dance moves. I'm just, I, I saw them once. That's a pretty good show. But um, if you can't, then you don't get to stay. And we have to get back to that kind of freedom and responsibility. Because if we won't resurrect our thirst for freedom and responsibility and community, if there's no welfare state, people will still help each other. They'll just actually help each other rather than surrender money to the government and just think that everything's been solved when everything's in fact been made worse. So forget about all this homogeneity and this and that and the other. You cannot reestablish, even if I thought it was a great goal, you cannot reestablish homogeneity without 
unbelievable amounts of blood and violence and i think it would happen naturally without the state because like i touched on a little bit earlier uh, people want to and tend to form intentional homogeneous homogeneous uh, i can't say the word you know what i mean yeah, yeah. communities because it just creates it's more efficient. positive social outcomes it's because we don't live forever and we can't learn everyone else's language and culture and religion and offense and jokes and humor i mean you, you can't so i mean if there's if there's a little italy here and there's a little bangladesh there and there's a little wherever they i mean it's fine it's fine you know go enjoy your culture maybe come dip into mine i'll go enjoy your culture it's fine just no coercion no coercion, no centralized agency that controls how this plays out and gives vast amounts of power to one group versus another. Either regain freedom or everything's going to get worse. And if we focus on immigrant groups and we think that that is the problem, we are missing it. They are not the problem. The problem is ourselves. The problem is that our ancestors fought for freedom of the state. And then a generation after women got the vote, we just sold it right back again, then didn't we? Yeah, yeah, that's, that's all true. So, it, yeah, I totally agree with you. It is the state that is the root of uh, all evils. <laughs> no, no, way. no. Oh my God, Jordan, <laughs> you know, it's just like getting you to connect with this is insane. I'm like trying to push two giant magnets. Opposing magnets together. They touch and fly apart. You're now saying the state is the problem. What if I said? And you don't have to agree with the me. State I, is just the facilitator to, I just at least yeah. like you to understand what I'm saying, even if you disagree with me. Because when you repeat back to me what you think I've said, it's not what I've said. What did I say the problem is? The problem is that the state facilitates the... Uh... No! <laughs> the state is another symptom. It's like the media. It's like migrants. It's a symptom. What is the problem? What well, people not being informed of the fact that uh, of Western immorality, as you put it, of um, it's the individual, you know, co coercive it's the individual, yeah, it's the individual who turns away from facts and arguments and reality. It's the people who scream racism and front the media with who, who then uses it to promote lies and investigate more conversations and so on. It's each individual who is the problem. It's the people who want the welfare state because they don't want either personal responsibility or helping those people genuinely in need. I mean, get rid yep. of the welfare state, you open up the solution to people's problems. Right now, the welfare state is not solving anyone's damn problem except for the politicians who want to buy votes and people who want to sell their freedoms in return for a food card. So it is each individual that is the problem. We cannot solve this thing institutionally. You have to solve it at the level of individuals. Once individuals say, no more welfare state, it's destructive, it's destroying our culture, it's destroyed our families, it's destroying our communities, and it's making us a giant magnet for everyone who wants to come and exploit our system. No more welfare state, and I'm going to commit to helping people who need it. Personally, if you go down and bake them a cake, I'm going to go down and help clear their garden. I'm going to go down and watch their kids for an hour while they go look for a job. Oh, I don't know. Get involved. Live as a human community. The selfish atomism of the welfare state and post-welfare state society. I don't need to get to know the poor. I don't need to help the poor. I don't need to roll my sleeves up. I don't need to do any of that stuff. I'm just going to ship money off to the government and everything's going to be fine. I'm going to be just peachy. No. Give up the welfare state and get engaged with people again. It's a joyful, wonderful thing. It really helps people. It brings communities back together. It brings neighbors back together. And it helps us need each other again because the welfare state has made us no longer need each other at all. Now, communities are like an appendix. You just hope it doesn't blow up on you, <laughs> I guess. So, <laughs> sorry, Tucker. I mean, that's not a great joke for you these days. Glad you're feeling better. But um, no, it is, it is each individual are they willing to give up their addiction to the fruits of state power? Are they willing to give up their addiction to the fruits of state power? If they're not, they're the problem. If they are, they're the solution. And it comes down to that individual choice, that individual decision, those individual conversations. And it means enforcing that in your social circle wherever you can.